Good morning. How are you this morning? Feel like spring? I hear winter coming this week a couple of days. Huh? All right. Well, good enough. Well, we're glad to have the uh, Bishop Felix this morning is with us, and so we're glad to have him here. And so uh, he wants to uh, share a few words with you this morning right away, and so I'm going to call upon him to do that. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to be with you all. I said I'm Bishop Felix Malpica of the Cross Area Synod. Uh, just began my ministry here with you all back in September. So about six months into my ministry. Uh, it's, uh, it's a joy, actually. It's been a joy because it's a bit of a move home. My wife, Jessica, uh, she grew up on the other side of the river in a little town called Eitzen, Eitzen, Minnesota. Uh, and about 250 people there, so don't worry if you don't know. Uh, and we've got two kids, a four-year-old and a two-year-old, so we're very busy at home. Uh, and I just wanted to say a few words about that thing that I walked in with. Many of you might recognize it as a shepherd's hook, because you've got your shepherd here with you all. Um, but it's called a crozier. That's what that symbol is. And it's, it's been a long-standing symbol that a bishop would carry with them, uh, a crozier. And there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, the word synod actually means those walking together. So the La Crosse area synod is 73 congregations walking together in life and ministry. And the word bishop quite literally means overseer. Uh, and so as bishop, I am the overseer of these 73 congregations walking together. Uh, and so in many ways, quite literally a shepherd. And, and well, uh, the shepherd's hook is a symbol of the, the shepherd's power, the bishop's power, that sometimes you get a congregation or a pastor that gets an eye and you got to pull them back in. Um, but also as a symbol of one who is looking out for the health and, uh, of, of the group of and making sure to keep you know, predators away, and, but the, my, my favorite symbol, actually, is that when I walk into a space holding that crozier, it's a symbol that it's not just Felix Malpica walking in, but that it is me as, as the embodiment of our joint relationships, that in the Catholic Church, they have a cathedral, they actually build a building that represents this area's collective ministry. For the Lutherans, we install a bishop, somebody of flesh and blood, who is the representative of our collective work together. And so every time that maybe that catches your eye because it's new and different up front, let it remind you that, that, that your church that you're a part of is bigger than the people in this room. That it includes 73 congregations all around this area, but even bigger than that. Because through me and through the ELCA, you're connected to 65 synods that are all around this country doing good work in ministry around the country and around the world, that because of your ministry here and because of these relationships, you can honestly say you have a part in what's going on in Ukraine right now. Um, that you, because of your work, because of your support, there are people helping uh, the refugee crisis that are happening on the borders, that there is aid happening right now because of you, that there is uh, literally missionaries all around the world. And, and, and actually one of our uh, missionaries lives in Slovakia, uh, who's on our roster. And uh, so please pray for him and his family and even uh, a former uh, assistant to the Bishop, Lenny Westfall, his uh, sister lives in Ukraine uh, and has decided to stay. She's a farmer there and she's caring for animals, doesn't want to leave them. Uh, and so it is there caring for them. So please pray for, for both of those families. But again, um, when that catches your eye, let it remind you that your church is bigger, much bigger than just this one place, but includes many, many people all around this area and literally around the world. One last thing I'll say is, as I've gone from place to place with my crozier, um, if I'm doing a children's message, I'll bring it with me and I'll have the kids put their hands on it and say a prayer with me. And so I can tell you that I'm carrying with me the fingerprints of every child that, that, that I have that, from every church that I've been to. And then usually the adults say, well, what about my fingerprints? <laughs> and so uh, as we say uh, goodbye to each other on the way out, if you want to come shake my hand, but also if you want to 
put your hand on the crozier and leave your fingerprint too. I do carry with me the fingerprints of many individuals throughout the synod. So again, a remembrance that uh, the whole church is here with you, praying for you, recognizing you. And because of you, this whole church is possible. So thank you. Thank you for your ministry, and I look forward to worshiping with you today. <coughs> So we're going to get out our fingerprint dusting and make sure whose fingerprints on. <laughs> Please rise as we begin our worship this morning. We gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the name of God who makes a way in the wilderness, walks with us, and guides us in our pilgrimage. Amen. Amen. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you, we have not trusted your promises, we have ignored your prophets in our own day, we have slandered our inheritance of grace, we have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have mercy on us, forgive us and turn us again to you, teach us to follow in your ways, assure us again of your love. And help us to love our neighbor. Amen. <laughs> Beloved in Christ, the word draws near to you, and all who call out to God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again, and gathers you under the wings of love. In Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven, and God journeys with you and teaches you how to live in love. Amen. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 63, as we read it responsibly. O oh God, you are my God. Eagerly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Therefore I gaze upon you in your holy place that I might behold your power and your glory. For your steadfast love is better than life itself. My lips shall give you praise. So will I bless you as long as I live, and lift up my hands in your name. My spirit is content as with the richest of foods, and my mouth praises you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, and meditate on you from my night watches. For you have been my helper, and under the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My whole king clings to you, the right hand holds me fast. You may be seated. I sing our hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing. <clears throat>
Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. To those who have experienced long years in exile, to return to their homeland is a celebration of abundant life. God calls them into an everlasting covenant of love. Those who return to God will enjoy new life and forgiveness, because God's ways are not our ways. First reading is from Isaiah chapter 55. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make with... <coughs> I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. See, you should call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord, that he may have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Paul uses images from Hebrew scriptures and prophecy to speak the truth of Jesus Christ. He is our rock, our water, our food, and our drink. Christ is the living sign of God's faithfulness. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them and they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters as some of them did, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some did and were destroyed by serpents. <coughs> and do not complain, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to serve, these things happened to them to serve as an example. And they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide a way out so that you may be able to endure. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Okay, time for kids. Come on, some of you other ones who got people who have, to have more adults come on. Hey, I brought my friend back. Huh? You miss him this week? Yeah. All right. Okay. So, you know, when he was at your house, was there anything bad that happened? He got tangled a few times. Yes, that happens, doesn't it, huh? So, what happened when you, uh, when he got tangled, what did you do? You went to dad. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a good idea, I'd say. Well, if you think about life, and you guys are a little bit young for uh, to have a lot, but you've had some. Are there things in life that kind of get you tangled up? Yeah? That are troublesome? Or you said something or did something you shouldn't have? Or maybe you didn't do things you should have done? said, you know, life kind of gets tangled up. You know, we could, from a, from a standpoint in the church, we could call that sin. Okay? Because we kind of get tangled up. And you know what? Guess what happens? We need to uh, find a way out. Well, when this guy gets tangled up, we take him to dad. Good dad, good dad. Dad's a good, good God figure, huh? Huh? Pretty good? Sure. So, when we think about that, we need to... Uh, Think about the person of Jesus. That when we get tangled up in life, and so when life becomes mm, pretty trying, and we really get tangled up sometimes, we have to think about that Jesus is one who always we can go to, and He will be the one who will save us from whatever it is that we need to be forgiven about. So good enough. All right. Do you, you want to take a moment, sweet? <laughs> She wanted to, and now you want to, and now she's ambivalent about her, I'm sure. So anyway, you guys can deal with it. So keep it from getting tangled up. Please rise and for the God. Chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. 
At that very time, there was some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now, just to clarify, Pilate had gone and actually in the middle of a service, a worship service, had killed some people. And that's why it says it, mingling their blood with their sacrifices. So something very terrible had just happened in the community. And they're coming to Jesus and saying, why, why did this happen? So, so Jesus asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way that they were worse sinners than all others in Galilee? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent... You will all perish, just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year, until I dig around it, put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. So the question is, why do, good, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to good people? Was there something bad about these people that, that maybe God made this happen? Was it God? Was it God that made these bad things happen? Is there a question? And Jesus gives an emphatic, no. Absolutely not. This is not God's work. This does not have to do with their sin. This does not have to do with who they are in the world. Sometimes bad things happen. But... He says, but it is important that we repent. It is important that we change our lives. It is important that sometimes when we see uh, tragic things happen in the world, that we take stock of who we are and who we are in the world, how we relate to the world, how we relate to one another. It is important that we pay close attention to how we live in the world and perhaps allow God to and Jesus Christ to change how we live in the world. Uh, as we've been going through the Gospel of Luke, you will have noticed that repent comes up again and again and again. It comes up right in the beginning. You hear John the Baptist calling out in the middle of the wilderness, come and repent. And that word repent literally means to turn around. It means to change, right? And so John the Baptist is out there at the River Jordan, which is this kind of uh, boundary line. It's the border between the promised land and the wilderness. And so out there in this kind of in-between space, John is calling people to come out and change your life. Right here in this in-between place where we, we have this promise of a promised land and yet we have been wandering through a wilderness, we're caught kind of in between, start to change your life. And then we hear from Mary this song of repentance, the Magnificat, right? This song about turning the world upside down, about bringing the heavy-handed power down and lifting up the lowly. And then again, you hear of, of God asking people to change their lives, to be transformed over and again in Jesus' ministry. And here, some bad things are happening in the community. Some bad things are happening in the world. They're coming to Jesus for comfort. And Jesus says, you know, let's not get stuck in the particularities of what's going on right now. Remember to focus in on you too. Remember that we have work to do in turning our lives around and living a new way, living a better way. And then he tells this parable about this fig tree that hasn't been producing fruit for three years. So a word about fig trees. Um, back then, fig trees really were meant to be this kind of source 
of food, not just for whoever owned the tree, but they were meant to be food for kind of the whole community. That they were kind of intentionally along the roads, closer to where people might be passing by, not in the interior of the farms. And as they were lining uh, the roads, it was meant as a food source for the poor. It was meant as a food source for uh, hungry passers-by. It was meant as a way for people who were hungry to come and grab something off of this tree and get something to eat. And so this tree has been sitting there doing nothing, providing no food for the hungry providing no respite for the weary traveler. And so for three years, it keeps coming back and says, well, why do I even have this tree out here? It's not feeding anyone. It's not doing any traveler any good. Let's, let's cut it down. Let's get rid of it. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. But there's a, there's a gardener there who says, okay, now just wait, just wait a second. Let's give it one more year. Let's, let's cultivate the soil. Let's prepare it. Let's do some hard work. Let's, let's take one more chance to give this tree an opportunity to actually produce fruits, to feed the hungry, to be there as a symbol of hope, to be there when somebody is tired and traveling for a long time, that they might just get a break in the midst of their travels. Let's give it one more chance. Let's do some hard work. So it says, okay, let's give it one more year. Let's put in Well, the church, the church is in that place right now, I think. I think the last, well, almost three years, it's been hard to see the fruits of our collective labor. It's been a hard time to say, where have we been drawing nourishment? And how have we been feeding those who are outside our walls? How have we been doing the job of feeding the hungry, of clothing the naked, of visiting those who are lonely, of reaching out to our communities behind, beyond our doors? And do we need to do some cultivating? Do we need to do some preparation? Do we need to do some digging in the soil uh, to bring some life back into, into our church? That's what we're called to be doing right now, I think. I think collectively, not just here, not just here in Arcadia, but all around the city, I think the church is needing to look back at itself and say, how can we get back to being the ones who provide good fruit for the sake of our communities? How can we be the ones that when people see it, they can see a sign of oh, peace, see it as a sign of a place where they can find rest, see it as a sign of a place where they can be comforted, see it as a place where they can uh, find sanctuary, home, shelter. And all across the Synod, I'm beginning to, to, to cultivate this new mission statement. That, that we need to do the work of cultivating life-giving relationships in this world. That that's our calling as a church. That rooted in God's love, we need to do the hard work of cultivating life-giving relationships. A life-giving relationship between us and God, between us and one another, congregation to congregation, minister to minister, synod to congregation, uh, and even us with creation all around us, uh, each congregation with the community that they're in, that we need to get into the soil and, well, maybe put some manure on it and get a little bit messy. Or maybe it's the hard work of digging into some soil that's just been too compacted. Over time, maybe it's the hard work of turning things around and digging in and getting your hands messy that maybe it requires a little bit of disturbing. That's what cultivating soil is, right? That you got to disturb the soil so that it can bring life once more. And here's the thing, though. Um, cultivating, there's no guarantees. Just like for this tree. There's no guarantee that it will produce fruit in the next year. It's an act of faith. It's an act of faith. We do this work of cultivating life-giving relationships. We do this work of trying to ask ourselves the difficult questions of how can we best represent who God is in the world, here and now. And we try to do some hard work uh, for that to see if maybe someone can be fed, someone can be nurtured, but there's no guarantees that will bring more people back into the pews. There's no guarantees that it will... Uh, 
grow the church, grow the congregation. There's no guarantees that the fruits will come, but we do it on faith. On faith that the Holy Spirit can, will, and does move in with and among us. That, that Jesus Christ really does show up when we open up our hearts to others. There's a, a, a professor up at Luther Seminary, Andy Root, who talks about when we have a relationship with someone, when we open up a space where, where we just have an honest and open relationship with another human being, just open up our hearts to them. That when we do that, when we connect with another person, then Jesus Christ shows up. And when Jesus Christ is present, anything can happen. Healing can happen, restoration can happen, new growth can happen. A fig tree might just produce fruits once more. That when we open up our hearts to someone else, not thinking, well, what can I get out of you? Because I'm sure you've felt that before. Somebody asked you to go out for coffee, you thought, oh, great, we're going to have a chance to catch up. And then they had something they wanted from you. You thought, oh, man... That's not what I wanted. I wanted to connect with someone. But when you honestly go and reach out to someone, just to meet them, to see who they are, to share life together, to honor the Holy Spirit's work between the two of you, then something else can happen. Just even simply, here's a challenge for you, so to speak, a way you can begin uh, cultivating some soil in your own life. When you say, uh, how are you? Mean it. Right? How often do you walk up to someone and say, hey, how are you? You say, good, and you keep walking. Right? That wasn't a real question. You didn't open up the space for Jesus to show up in that encounter. But what if you actually said, hey, how are you? And stopped. Listen. Listen to how they were. Maybe, just maybe, they needed that moment to say, actually, I had a rough week. Actually, I've been struggling. Actually, I have this joyous thing that I've been wanting to tell somebody, but I have nobody to tell because nobody actually stopped to listen. What if we were that community? And now, I know you folks do this well, because I've heard already, I hear a lot of murmurs throughout the church, and I've heard that you're a group that actually loves to do this. But when worship is done, you say, how are you and mean it? This is something that you know how to do. This is something that you are already practicing here inside this room. And so maybe the challenge is to take it outside of this room. Take it back to school. Take it back uh, to your places of work. Take it back to your neighborhoods. Uh, take it back into this community. And, and then people might wonder, what's going on in that church? These people actually stop when they say, how are you? They actually mean it. They actually want to care for us. They want to share the love of God with this community. Then maybe just maybe, new life will start to grow. Then maybe a hungry traveler might see a fire and be able to take light. Then maybe the hungry poor will be fed once more. Then maybe Jesus will show up and provide healing, will provide restoration, will provide new life, because that's what Jesus does. Jesus brings life and love when we allow the Spirit space to do its work in our hearts and in our communities. Amen. Amen.
join together and confess our common faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us be I, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to death. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this day. We give thanks for the signs of spring. We give thanks for gathering together here in worship. Help us to take seriously those things of repentance, of those uncertainties that calls us to faith, to believe in those things that you do to act through your spirit, to encourage us both today, tomorrow, and forever. Help us to be your people in every place. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. This morning we pray for many people, but especially those still in Ukraine. For those that we may even know or have some acquaintance. That we pray for their safety. We pray for those who have been exiled. For those who are refugees. We pray for those who are under attack. We pray for those who suffer the loss of loved ones, whether they be soldiers or civilians. And so, Lord, help us to keep them in our hearts and our minds, to pray for them, and to encourage those who are able to make a real difference in feeding the hungry, in military ways, in whatever else, whatever else it takes to bring peace to Ukraine. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, today we pray for this congregation and its call process. We pray for the call committee. We pray for the council. We pray for the committees that help this congregation function. We pray for the congregation as whole and for all members that need to take their part and to share their gifts to help this congregation become more whole. And Lord, we pray also for the wider church, for the synod, for all Christian congregations everywhere. And so help us to have not only a sense of ministry here, but a ministry that reaches to all parts of your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we have special concerns for ourselves and for others. And so as we come to you today, whatever they may be, we take this moment to share in our hearts in silence. In our congregation and community, we especially remember Eldon and Helen Bird, Bill Borcher, for Brad Celeste that was in hospitalized this week, for Ramona English, Donald Fetty, Dennis Payne. Dale Howard as he looks forward to returning home next Saturday, for Chad Keister, for Jeremy Rupp, Gene Sampson, Lorraine Shepherd, Carol Wheeler. Family of Lester Gustave, family of Carl Stone, the family of Gerd Kern. Lord, all these we hold up for you and whatever else you see that we might need and what your people need, both in our lives and the lives of others. We give thanks and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Share the peace with each other as you are comfortable. <laughs> 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 Thank you.
again, we will serve communion as we come up and start on this end of work the cross and we'll please fill in and see you In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, and shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us join together and pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, that we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come, all is ready.
May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his holy precious blood strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto eternal life. Shalom. Our benediction. So I'll be, uh, I'll be sharing a benediction for you. It's the same words, but uh, several years ago it got put to music, uh, and I kind of fell in love with it, and I've been sharing it with congregations as I go from place to place.